Thank you for watching The Word and Sword presented by the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call in during this program to ask your Bible questions. Call 828-465-3009. This episode of The Word and Sword includes a continued study of the sacrifice of the Son with a focus on the Lord's arrest and trial before the Jews. Next is a brief encouragement to diligently seek God. We go on to study a controversial topic, baptism, and look at both errors and objections. Our fourth segment looks at Jesus' first recorded miracle when he turned water to wine. We wrap up the program with a continuation of our study in 1 Peter as we look at the Christian's relationship to government and employers. Again, thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. We encourage you to call 828-465-3009 and ask your Bible questions. In this lesson, we continue our series of studies on the sacrifice of the Son. And we begin in Isaiah chapter 53, where Isaiah prophesies about the abuse and miscarriage of justice that happened with Jesus when he came into this world, was put on trial, and of course, executed as an innocent man. Particularly in Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. You know, Isaiah talks about the fact that when Jesus came to this earth, that men turned away from him, they forsook him, they turned their back on him, how that he was despised and he suffered wrongfully. And the fact that he was silent in going through this, in other words, he yielded to the mob as they took him and put him on trial and put him to death. The Lord did this so that our iniquities could be forgiven, so that we could have redemption of our sins and of our souls, or from our sins and redemption of our souls. As we reflect on what the Lord did for us, as we study about His sacrifice, our minds ought to be impressed with the grace of God, how magnificent, how wonderful it is. And our hearts should be broken that Jesus went through this because of us, because of our sins, our rebellion, our failings before God. And it should compel us. So we think about what he did for us. It should compel us to devote our lives to him and to his glory. So we want to continue in our study now and going to John chapter 18. John 18, as we pick up after Jesus had gone to the Father in prayer as he was in the garden. And remember, he had asked this cup would pass, but not my will, but your will be done. In John chapter 18, we want to pick up here in verse 2 and notice what it says about the mob that comes out to arrest Jesus. In John 18, verse 2, And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he answered them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way that the saying might be fulfilled, which, was, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put up your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? 
Now let's go over to Matthew's account as we fold these two together. In Matthew chapter 26, we want to pick up here in verse 47 and notice Matthew's parallel account as he gives some different details about what's unfolding here. In Matthew 26, 47, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword shall die by the sword or perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled, that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Now let's put these things together. It says that there's great mob came out to arrest him in the garden. Luke says it included some of the chief priests and the elders. So not the high priest, but the chief priests and the elders. It included a temple guard. In John's account, remember over in John 18, said Judas had received a detachment of troops. That's an official word in the, in the original language. It means cohort which was a military unit in the Roman army, and it would consist of between five to six hundred men. Now, some have suggested it wasn't a formal uh, designation of a cohort here, maybe one or two hundred soldiers, but the idea is there's a lot of soldiers along with the crowd that's gathered with them to go out and arrest Jesus. So we're talking about hundreds of people going out here to arrest Jesus. And Jesus, when they approach him, John says, identified himself. He confronted those who came out against him. And when he did that, it says, when he said, I am he, that they drew back and fell to the ground. But why would they do that? You have this overwhelming force coming against against Jesus and his handful of disciples. Why would they be nervous? Well, it could be that some of them had either seen or heard firsthand accounts of the miracles Jesus had performed in and around Jerusalem because he had done many in this area. And maybe it is that they knew about that and they're concerned about it. Maybe they remember at least the Jewish element among them, how that soldiers were sent to arrest Elijah the prophet in 2 Kings chapter 1, and they were struck dead when they went to arrest Elijah the prophet. Maybe they're nervous about those kinds of things. But even though Jesus identified himself, we see that Judas also identified him. He had given the signal, whomever I kiss, he's the one, arrest him. This was for the purpose of giving a positive ID because these people did not want to go out there and arrest the wrong man and Jesus get away. They didn't want to arrest one of his disciples, for instance, and Jesus escape. So Judas is there to give a positive ID. This is Jesus of Nazareth. This is the one because they didn't have a database with this picture in it. So they needed somebody there to make sure that they got the right man. And it's at this point that Peter drew his sword and he swung it. And evidently he's trying to cut the head off of the servant of the high priest. And he misses somehow, cuts off his ear. But be that as it may, It's interesting that Matthew records for us that Jesus responds to Peter. And there's two things that we want to notice here. Number one, Peter was armed without objection. In fact, over in Luke 22, verse 36, when Jesus was preparing his disciples to go out into the world, he told them, if you don't have a sword, go and get one. He was telling them they needed to be ready to defend themselves, to protect their lives as they go out into a world that's filled with danger. 
as they're traveling about, they may face robbers and, and things like that. And so they needed to be able to protect themselves. So he was armed without objection by the Lord. But then also he tells him that he could call 12 legions of angels. Now, a legion of angels was between 66 and 72, or this would have been altogether between 66 and 72,000. Back in 2 Kings chapter 19, it talks about an angel killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. So if one angel can do that, how many could 66 to 72,000 kill? The answer is they could take any army, any opposition that existed. And here's the idea that if Jesus wanted to establish an earthly kingdom and reign on a literal throne in Jerusalem, if he wanted to do that, he could have done it 2,000 years ago. But that's not his aim and that's not his purpose. And that's what he's telling Peter. Peter's willing to fight a physical battle and to die for the Lord. But the Lord's telling him, Peter, that's not what I'm about. That's not what the way that the will of God is to be accomplished. So he tells him, put your sword away because he's going to willingly go with them. Well, the mob comes out to arrest him. They come out against him like he's a vicious criminal, uh, which he was not, of course, but that's the way that they're presenting it. They come with the clubs and swords, and besides the fact of hearing about Jesus, maybe they heard about the sons of thunder, you know, James and John, and how they were fiery, and Judas might have informed them, you know, these guys may be willing to fight, as we see Peter's willing to fight, so you may need some power when you go out here. So they go out to arrest him, and when they do this, the account told us that the disciples fled. And there's a great lesson here. The difference between conviction and convenience. When the disciples were with Jesus in the upper room observing the Passover, it was convenient for them to be bold and to say, we're ready to go with you. We're ready to die with you. Just like Peter did, all of them did. It was convenient for them to say that in the upper room. But when they're in the garden, and the mob comes out against them with the clubs, with the swords, with the weapons, it's not convenient. And so you see that their conviction is not what they tried to claim it was. So conviction versus convenience. It's not always convenient to be bold and to do what the Lord would have you to do, to stand with Him. But that's the resolve that we need to have. These men, their resolve was not there at this time. Their conviction was not what it needed to be. But let's go on now and notice in John chapter 18 how that Jesus goes on trial before the Jewish leaders. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Now we pick up in John 18, verse 12. Then the detachment of troops, the captain of the officers of the Jews, arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now jump down to verse 19 with me as it continues this narrative. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So what's going on here? First of all, you have these two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. 
And what that is, is Annas is the elder and he served as high priest officially for the Jews from around 6 to 15 AD. And his son-in-law, Caiaphas now, at this time, is serving as high priest. He was appointed as high priest in 18 AD, and he served until 36 AD. Now, let's just put all this together. It's around 29 AD. <clears throat> it's around the middle portion of Caiaphas, his role as high priest as appointed by the Romans. But the Jews really looked to Annas. He had a lot of influence with them. And so they take him first to Annas so that Annas has an opportunity to interview Jesus, to talk about what is happening here. And Caiaphas then later is going to take Jesus to the Romans because he's the one that the Romans recognize. So be that as it may, again, he's taken to Annas to, to give him an opportunity to ascertain the charges, to collect evidence. They're probably waking the council and informing them that they've arrested Jesus and it's time to get things done. Because remember, Jesus observed that Passover on Thursday night. He went to the garden, and this is now very early on Friday morning in the wee hours of the morning, maybe 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4, some, somewhere in there. And these men now know that they have Jesus, so they need to be woken up. They need to be brought together so they can have the official trial that we'll talk about in just a minute. But they're gathering witnesses at this time, too. And as he's there before Annas and talking to him, being interviewed by him, Annas asks, you know, tell me about your disciples. Tell me about your doctrine. And Jesus just simply responds, I've done all this in the open. I did it publicly in the synagogues. I did it publicly at the temple. So go ask them what I've said. I've not tried to hide anything from anyone. I've declared what I believe in, in what I do openly. So there's nothing that's being hidden here. And then that officer, of course, struck him wrongfully as he responded to the high priest. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 14. Mark 14, what we read there in John said that Annas sent him over to Caiaphas the high priest. In Mark chapter 14, verse 53, then beginning, it says this, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spat on him or spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, we also want to look at Matthew 26 in just a moment because we're trying to fold these accounts together and, and see the different perspectives that the gospel writers have about what's unfolding here. So, first of all, this is sort of an informal arraignment. They, again, are probably at the high priest residence, and they are gathering these witnesses, and it's a series of false witnesses that don't have any charges that they can grab onto, so to speak. And as the chief priests, as the high priests, as the elders are listening to these witnesses, 
There's nothing that they see they can go on until these two false witnesses come in and they both say, well, he said he would destroy this temple and build another in three days. Now, their testimony didn't even agree. So there's nothing that they're really able to get to hold on to that they can charge him with. And it says that Jesus during this time remained silent, even when he was prompted, you know, don't you have anything to say back to what they're accusing you of? He remained silent. The reason he remained silent is because these are false charges. There's no truth in him at all. So he just ignored those false charges. But then Matthew's account tells us that the high priest put him under oath in Matthew 26, verse 63. And he put him under oath and he said, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, you and I look at that as one question because we equate Christ with the Son of God. But look at it from the Jewish perspective. The Jews had this view that the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, would come and be like David and be an earthly ruler and a warrior and a great king who would reestablish the glory of Israel and throw off the yoke of the Romans and establish them again as a great power. And that's the Christ to them. That charge of being the Christ, the king, if you will, of Israel is going to be used as a political charge when they take him before Pilate later, that's ultimately what he's convicted on. But then they also ask this question, are you the son of God? Now, that's a religious question, and it's something they're going to use with the Jews because they accuse him of blasphemy. So there's two subtle charges that they're bringing out against him here with asking, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? Now, Jesus answered in the affirmative to both of them. He says, yes, it is as you say. Yes, I am the Christ, the son of the living God. So he also tells them, you're going to see me at the right hand of the power, the right hand of God in a position of authority, and I'm going to come in the clouds of heaven. And what he's doing there is he's taking Old Testament prophetic language and telling them, I'm going to judge you, just like in the Old Testament when it talked about God riding in the clouds and coming against Egypt or coming against Babylon. It was talking about God's judgment against those nations. So Jesus is saying, you're judging me now, but I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to do it with the power, the authority of God. And so they hear that, and they are outraged and declare him guilty, and the council agrees with that, and they say he's deserving of death. So let's notice now, when that happens, that they begin to mock him, to abuse him. In Luke chapter 22, let's go back to Luke chapter 22, and there's something that we want to pick up on here in Luke chapter 22, and notice the parallel, verses 63 to 65. Now, the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. They blindfolded him. They struck him on the face, asking him, you know, prophesy who is the one who struck you, and many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. But if you back up now and notice what had just happened, it tells us about Peter being out in the courtyard and how he denied the Lord and he just denied him for the third time. And it says the rooster crowed in verse 61, Luke twenty two sixty one. 61. Now the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord knew what Peter had just done. Peter standing out in the courtyard, Jesus on trial there. He's being uh, accused of things. He's now been convicted of blasphemy or they, they've charged him with blasphemy at this point would really be what's happening. And he looks over when Peter denied him the third time, how painful that was for him. And then right after that, these men begin to mock him, to abuse him, to slap him, to spit on him, to treat him just so shamefully. How painful all of that must have been for Jesus emotionally as he went through that. Now, 
Continue in Luke 22 with me, verse 66, and notice what's happening. It says, As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and the scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe, and if I ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So we back up again. When he was arrested, he was first taken to Annas. And Annas asked him about his disciples and his doctrine. And then he sends him over to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas interviews him. You have these one false witness after another. Nobody's testimony sticks. And so Caiaphas puts him under oath. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed or the son of God? He answered in the affirmative. And they all said he's deserving of death. Now Luke tells us they go into their council. So the first one was like an arraignment, if you will. And the second one is the official formal trial where they're going to not only charge him, but they're going to find him guilty, convict him here. And so they already know what they can charge him with. And that's why they asked him, are you the Christ? And the Lord says, well, if I answer that, you're not going to let me go. If I ask you questions, you're not going to answer them. And so this is all just a sham trial. And then they ask, are you the son of God then? He says, yes. And that's when they convict him of blasphemy. That makes him guilty religiously before the Jews, before the Jewish people. Well, here's a, a, a man guilty of blasphemy, and the penalty for blasphemy is death. So that's what's going on with the Jews. Now, as we think about what he's going through here, he's going to be led off to Pilate. He's going to be convicted there. He's going to be crucified. Jesus is going through all of this for you and I. As we think about what he went through, it should cause us to reflect on the grace of God. And it should sadden us that he had to go through this because we sinned and we don't pay that penalty. He paid that penalty. And then it should also motivate us. It should compel us. It should drive us to devote ourselves to him, to be dedicated to Christ and to bringing him glory. And as you reflect on that, if you recognize you need to draw closer to the Lord, we invite you to reach out to us. We want to help you to do that, to serve him and to honor him because of what he has done for you. Thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. The members of the Newton Church of Christ are simply a group of individuals seeking to follow the New Testament as our soul rule of authority, our sole source of understanding God and His will and pleasing and honoring Him, striving to help one another get to heaven. And we want to help others to get to heaven. So we are looking to connect with people who desire to diligently seek God, as Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 states here, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes something that is very similar to that, that connects to that. He says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent to present yourself approved of God. And he goes on to say, rightly dividing the word. The idea is there that you would know the word of God. You would research it. You would meditate on it. You would apply that in your life. You rightly divide it. You rightly apply it. You have the correct understanding, the correct application of it in your life that you would be approved of God is what the apostle Paul is saying there. In Acts chapter 17, you have where Paul goes to uh, preach to the people, first at Thessalonica, and then he goes to Berea. 
And it says in reference to the people at Berea in Acts 17, 11, these were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of scripture, a readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They searched the scripture daily. They were diligently seeking God. They were diligently applying themselves to be approved of God, rightly dividing the word. And so we want to connect with individuals who want to diligently seek God, who are serious students of the Bible. They really want to know, what does it say? How am I to live? How am I to worship? Where am I to worship? What congregation should I be a part of? What religious group? is following the will of God, not people who uh, simply accept anything that they hear that sounds good at the moment or simply stirs up their emotions. But what is it that the Word of God actually teaches? We want to connect with those individuals. We want to study with you. We want you to visit with us in our services. And so we appeal to you to reach out to us and connect with us. You can call us at 828-465-3009. And if you do not get someone at that time, a direct connection, then please leave a message and we will get back to you. But then also you can visit our website at wordandsword.com. That's wordandsword.com. And go there, and on that website, you'll see past episodes of this program. You will also find our latest sermons that are posted there as audio files. And then you can also find other Bible study material. So we invite you to connect with us. We would love to study with you as you diligently seek God, as we diligently seek God, so that we can help one another to realize that reward that he has for us at the end. In Psalm 119, 104, it says, Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. The Word of God enlightens us. It tells us what the truth is, but it also exposes error. And if we are going to be a people who love God and honor God, We are going to turn to his word to see the truth, to follow that path of truth, to give us understanding in what is pleasing to him and to be able to recognize error and to reject that error. In fact, we are to hate error as much as we love truth. So we want to keep that in mind. As we look at the subject of baptism, we're going to look at errors and objections to the Bible's teaching on baptism. The first thing that we want to note in this is that Mormons believe that we can be baptized for people who are dead. They get this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul is addressing the error that was being spread at Corinth about the resurrection. And it was an error that said that the resurrection was um, not real. It wasn't going to happen. But be that as it may, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, this is what is written. It says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And the Mormons interpret that to mean that If you have a relative who's dead and is not right with God or there's a question about that, that you can go as a faithful Mormon and be baptized on their behalf after they're already dead and gone, and it will change their condition in the afterlife. But that's not what the apostle is discussing here. What he's looking at here is why would someone be baptized to prepare for the dead to be dead If the dead do not rise, there's no purpose in it. There's no reason for it. Because we know that the Bible teaches that we are responsible for our own salvation in the book of Philippians chapter 2. 
verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes this, Philippians 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so he says that we individually have the responsibility to work out our own salvation. I don't have the responsibility to work out yours and ensure that you're saved, that I can't do anything to save you. That is, I can't take an action that regardless of your life and your behavior changes your condition before God. Now, you have to make that change. I have to make that change in my life. So we are going to be accountable to God individually. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about, we will each stand before the throne of judgment when Christ returns and give an account for our lives before him. The Bible teaches that our condition as well cannot be changed after death. If you look at Luke chapter 16 and recall the account of the rich man and Lazarus and how the rich man was in torments. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom in paradise at peace. The rich man wanted to change or to be relieved of his torment. And Abraham points out to him, we can't go from you or from here to you, and you can't go from there to here over to us because this great gulf that is between torments and paradise in the Hadean world. And so our condition cannot change after we die, no matter what anybody here on earth does. So this baptism for the dead is not according to the word of God. Now, there are many religious groups that also believe in baptizing infants. They, they believe it is um, proper and appropriate to take a baby, even one that's only a few days old, and to, quote, baptize them. Usually they do this by sprinkling or pouring, which is not Bible baptism because Bible baptism is immersion. Um, but be that as it may, when they do that, uh, understand that they are not following what the Bible teaches about baptism and who needs to be baptized. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. You see, infants, little babies, have no ability to believe. They don't have the comprehension about Jesus being the Christ. And so there's no need to baptize them if they don't believe. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Apostle Peter, preaching on that day on Pentecost, he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So you have to not only believe, but you must repent if you're going to be baptized or leading up to baptism. So babies can't believe, but babies can't repent either. And they have no sins of which they must repent because babies are innocent. They're pure in the sight of God. They come into this world as pure and innocent. And if for some reason that they die, then they have no sins that are against them. So we understand that infant baptism is not according to the word of God and the teaching of the word on that. Now, there are others who believe or something that's not written in the Word of God regarding baptism. And what they do is they reorder what the Bible does teach. Let's go back to Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, where Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so you have belief plus baptism equals salvation. Now, Calvinist, the true Calvinist teaching and beliefs and doctrines, basically switches that up and says, he who is saved will believe and be baptized. So they start with salvation, whereas Jesus ended with salvation. You see how they reorder that? And then there's also the teaching of the Roman Catholics that, or rather of Baptists, excuse me, of Baptists who say, he who believes will be saved and should be baptized. 
Again, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Belief plus baptism, salvation. Baptist doctrine says belief, salvation, then baptism. You see how that's reordered there? And then now the Roman Catholic teaching of he who is baptized will be saved and later come to believe. They're ones who practice infant baptism. Jesus teaching again, belief plus baptism equals salvation. Roman Catholicism teaches baptism, salvation, belief. So men reorder what the Word of God teaches. Now, I think you can see and I can see how that's wrong. We can't reorder what God teaches about baptism. But then there are those also who change the the teaching of the Word of God on baptism and say, well, we are baptized as an outward sign of an inward grace. We're baptized because our sins have already been remitted. Now, is that what the Bible teaches? We go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 to notice this to start with in Acts 2 verse 38. Again, the Apostle Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost about Jesus being the Christ, how people there in the crowd were guilty of crucifying him. And the people had asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? So that's a sign of belief that Jesus is the Christ. They've accepted the teaching of Peter. And here's what Peter responds to them in Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're baptized for the remission of sins. Now, some say that word for means because of. So, um, I went to jail for reckless driving, let's say. They say, well, that means you went to jail because of reckless driving. And here it means you are baptized because your sins have been remitted. Well, do you repent? Because your sins have been remitted? That's one question. Now, we understand you repent in order to or leading unto the remission of sins. And you're baptized, and the same idea is you're baptized in order to or leading to the remission of sins. So keep your place there, maybe, in Acts 2. And also notice in Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is observing the Passover with his disciples. And as he's observing that Passover, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And in Matthew chapter 26, notice what he says beginning in verse 27. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Now here's the key part, verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So the same phrase, for the remission of sins. And by the way, it's the same in the Greek in both passages, just like it's the same in English in both passages. One says "You that my blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. The other one says you're baptized for the remission of sins. So let me ask you this question. If baptism is because your sins have been remitted, did Jesus shed his blood because your sins were remitted? Or was he, it was his blood shed to lead to the remission of sins? I think we can all see that very easily. Well, Jesus, when he's talking about his blood being shed for the remission of sins, he's looking forward to the cross when his life will be given on that cross. His blood will be shed in order that people's sins may be forgiven, not because they already had been forgiven, but leading to the remission of sins, as is extensively discussed in Hebrews chapter 9, by the way. So in the same vein, when Peter says we are to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, that means leading unto the remission of sins. Again, men 
take the Word of God and they change it up and they twist it to say something or to mean something that it does not say and it does not mean. Now, we're going to come back in just a moment and look further at objections raised to the idea of baptism being essential for the remission of sins. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search Word and Sword TV program. In regard to baptism, we have already looked at some errors that are taught and don't agree with the Bible that are commonly believed, commonly practiced. Now we want to look at some objections to the idea that baptism is essential for salvation. The first one we want to look at is some people say that non-belief is the only condition for condemnation. And they usually say this when you reference Mark chapter 16. If we go to Mark chapter 16 and notice what it says here, Mark 16, verse 16, where he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Well, when people say non-belief is the only condition of condemnation, not non-baptism, it's sort of making the same argument that the devil made in the garden to Eve. Remember that God had said there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, that they were to not eat of the fruit of the garden, which was in the midst of the garden, of the tree in the midst of the garden, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, he said, for the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And Eve understood that. And she repeated that in verse 3 of chapter 3, where God had said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Okay, so he added something in there. He added one word of not to negate what God was saying, to go against what God was saying. Now, God says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, Satan would say, he who believes and is not baptized will be saved. You see, people want to take out the positive affirmative command that Jesus himself said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And they want to change it into he who believes and is not baptized will be saved. Now, also think about this. There's really no need to state he who believes he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. You know, it's like this. He who believes and is baptized will get a new car. He who does not believe will not get a new car. You understand that. It's very simple, very easy to understand. In fact, if we were to say, you know what? Uh, anybody who believes and is baptized will receive a new, let's say, GMC Sierra pickup truck. You'll, you'll get a new one. Just come and confess your belief and be baptized and you'll get it. If we were to say that, people would not come to us and say, you know what? I heard what you said, but I think all I have to do is believe. They wouldn't say that. They would say, well, I need to believe and be baptized to get that. If we said he who believes and is baptized will get a new pickup truck, but he who does not believe will not get it, they're not going to quibble over baptism. They are going to comply with that to get that pickup truck. So when we think about salvation, how much more valuable is salvation than a truck? Infinitely more valuable. 
So why quibble? Why argue? Why object to what Jesus clearly, positively affirmed that we must do in order to be saved? Think about this. People say that baptism is not essential and that it doesn't have to say, you know, um, he, or they say he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And what they want is he who does not believe and is not baptized. Well, what about this parallel type of statement? He who jumps and falls will be injured, but he who does not jump will be safe. We understand that he who jumps and falls will be injured. Well, the falling is predicated on the jumping. And if you don't jump, you're not going to fall. See how that makes sense? He who eats and digests will be nourished. He does not eat, will not be nourished. You don't have to follow it with and does not digest because you're not going to digest if you don't eat. The same principle is true with regard to Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He does not believe will be condemned because baptism is predicated and preceded by belief. If you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized. So you don't have to state the second part of that that some people think needs to be stated. People also object and say this. Well, you know what? Baptism is a work and you can't earn your salvation. Well, first of all, let's understand that nowhere in the Bible does it say that baptism is a work. And these same people insist that you have to believe in order to be saved. Now, let's notice what the Bible says about belief in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. This is what Jesus told people who came to him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. He said that belief is a work, right? Now, that's not the idea that you believe in order to earn your salvation, to merit your salvation. It's you believe in order to comply with God's will. You can believe in obedience to the gospel of teaching that Jesus is the Christ. That's the idea. But he says belief is is a work. That's very interesting. When the Bible nowhere states that baptism is a work, and yet people try to say it's a work, and if you do it, then you're trying to earn your salvation, and you actually end up not having salvation, but being condemned. The fact of the matter is, the command to be baptized is something that we must comply with. It's a command to be obeyed. And Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But then also notice Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Peter's gone to the household of Cornelius and he is there preaching to them about Jesus. And in Acts 10, verse 48, it says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. He commanded it. When an inspired apostle gives a command, do we have the right to say, I don't think I need to do it. Or do we need to do what they say because they're inspired of the Holy Spirit to tell us what to do to be pleasing to God? It's a command that we are to obey. And it's a work, if you will, of righteousness as much as belief is a work of righteousness. But the Bible's very specific, as we said before, that belief indeed is a work. It's not a work of merit, but a work of righteousness. It is submission to the will of God to be pleasing to Him. Now, another objection that comes up is something that's based in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writing to the saints at Corinth, and he says this in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And so they'll say, well, see right there, Paul says he didn't go out to baptize, so we shouldn't be baptized. We don't need to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, let's note, first of all, when he says that he did not go to baptize, but to preach, 
that in Acts 18, where we have the record of Paul going to Corinth and preaching to them before he wrote that letter. In Acts 18, verse 8, says, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Well, that sounds a lot like Mark 16, 16, doesn't it? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. It says that they heard the word. Jesus has said, Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Here it says they heard, they believed, they were baptized. Paul was fulfilling what Jesus said in the Great Commission to go out, preach the gospel. They believe, they're baptized, they're saved. That's why they're being baptized here, in order to be saved. But people say, but Paul wrote, Paul wrote that he went out to, uh, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, back up in the context and notice what Paul is saying in verse 11. He says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So there are those who say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, or I'm of Christ, or Cephas, or of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I baptized, also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. <laughs> People say Paul didn't go out baptizing when he just finished saying, yeah, I did. I baptized Crispus and Gaius in the household of Stephanus. Besides that, he couldn't remember whether he baptized anybody else or not. So Paul did go out and baptize. And by the way, did you catch what he said? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And what he's saying is to be of Christ, Christ had to die for you. You had to be baptized in the name of Christ. And so he's the only one you should follow, not Paul or Cephas or Apollos. Do you get that? We have to be baptized in the name of Christ, not baptized in the name of Paul. If we are claiming to be of Paul, then Paul had to die for us and we had to be baptized in the name of Paul. But he's basically making the argument through rhetorical questions. You weren't baptized in the name of Paul, so you're not of Paul. You were baptized in the name of Christ. And so you are of Christ. So they were baptized. They believed after they heard and they were baptized. Now, what about his statement there in verse 17? But Christ, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. It's one of those not but statements. For Christ did not send me only to baptize, but also to preach. It's the idea. He's de-emphasizing one to emphasize the other. Who it was that actually immersed you in water is irrelevant. The one that you are submitting to is Christ. That's what matters. You're submitting to his command to be baptized. Well, then there are others who raise this objection. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized, and he was saved by faith alone. And so you look at the account of the thief on the cross in the book of Luke, in chapter 23. In Luke 23, we have that account written in here uh, when Jesus is there hanging on the cross and it says in verse 39, one of the criminals who was next to him said, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And here's what he said in verse 42 to Jesus. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So they say, well, see, the thief wasn't baptized and he was saved right there. Well, let me ask you something. Can you prove the thief wasn't baptized? How do you know he wasn't baptized? Because John had been out preaching and it talks about how that Jerusalem and all Judea went out to hear him preach and that many thousands heard the teaching of John and were baptized. Look at John chapter 3. Jesus also went out preaching. And John chapter 3 says that he made and baptized more disciples than John. 
So why is it that the thief couldn't have been one of them who later fell away? In John chapter 6, it says many turned away. Many of his disciples turned away from him and walked with him no more. Maybe he was among that crowd and got caught up in sin and became a thief or fell back into old habit of being a thief and was arrested and convicted and then crucified here next to Jesus. Here's the thing. How, how does belief come? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How did the thief hanging on the cross come to believe in Jesus? Because all the evidence at the moment as Jesus is on the cross was that he was rejected of God. The evidence that was seen there, there's, there's no preaching that Jesus is doing, you know, telling people, I'm the son of God and you need to believe in me to be saved. He's not doing that on the cross. The people who are standing around are making fun of him and mocking him and saying, you know, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe and things like that. So everything was saying that he was rejected of God, that he was a failure as he was hanging there on the cross. And yet this man who's hanging next to him believes in him. Now, maybe it is that he had heard teaching before either by Jesus, by the apostles, you know, the 70 were sent out even to preach among the children of Israel. Maybe it's John, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Maybe he had heard that at one time and he rejected it at that point. Maybe he accepted it and later rejected it and turned to a life of sin. But however it was, there's somewhere that he heard teaching that led him to believe at this point, Jesus is the Christ. So, when they say the thief wasn't baptized, number one, that can't be proven. He very well may have been baptized. But number two, he may have heard the teaching somewhere else and submitted to that teaching, whether under John, under Jesus, believed and was baptized previously. And now he's repenting here as he's hanging on the cross. But then one other thing we need to understand about this in Mark chapter 2, Mark 2, there's an incident of where men bring a paralyzed man in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus tells this man, you know, son, your sins are forgiven you in Mark 2 verse 5. And the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves... He said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts, which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Jesus proved he had power on earth to forgive sins. Okay, so as he's hanging there next to the thief, and the thief makes an appeal to him, Jesus had the power, the authority, to forgive sins on earth. He could forgive whom he willed, to forgive. We are under these conditions. We're not here with Jesus speaking to us and him just simply saying your sins are forgiven you. In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 verses 16 and 17, it says there that in order for a testament to be enforced, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. In Hebrews 9, verse 16, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Jesus was still alive on the cross is the point. That it wasn't until his death that the new covenant went into effect. When you say, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Or Peter is saying, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's under the new covenant. Jesus hadn't died on the cross. That covenant, that testament, the New Testament wasn't in force. 
we don't live in the same time under the same conditions as the thief on the cross. So we can't use him as a pattern of salvation and can't say, well, all we need to do is make an appeal to the Lord and he'll just forgive us in that moment. Now, we have to follow what the Bible teaches and what applies to us as we live under the new covenant. And that is to be baptized, to have the remission of sins. As we began this study, we talked about through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. The word of God enlightens us as to what's pleasing to God, what we must do to honor God in our life. And so we get understanding that baptism is essential for salvation. The second part of that is I hate every false way. We need to reject every false teaching about baptism. Because if we follow those, we will not be right before God. Our sins will not be forgiven. So we encourage you study this. And if you want to study with us more, if you have questions of us, please reach out and let us know. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828 465 3009. In the book of John, the Apostle John, who's the author, makes several great claims about Jesus. In fact, he begins the book with an incredible claim where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he's saying right at the start, Jesus is divine. He follows that up just a couple of verses later in verse 3 with this. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So he says he's the divine creator. Then if you go down to verse 18, he says this, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So he's saying that Jesus declares the Father. Jesus is one who shows people in this world who the Father is, that He has an intimate relationship and knowledge with the Father. And so, He makes these great claims. When you go through the book of John, you see that there is evidence that backs up these claims. It's not just the words that John writes, not just the words that Jesus preaches, but there is the power that is manifest in the miracles of Christ that prove what he said was true. And the first miracle that's recorded here is in John chapter 2, where Jesus turns water to wine. It's captured the attention of people, sometimes not in a really good way, because they'll take it and twist it to mean something that it was never intended to mean. So let's look at this miracle now in John 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, 
his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Now, let's back up and begin to break this down a little bit. First of all, in verses 1 through 5, we see that Mary expresses a confidence in Jesus when they are here at this wedding feast and there's the wine has run out. That's an embarrassing situation for the host of the feast. And so Mary, evidently, since it's Mary and her family, her bro- the uh, uh, brothers of Jesus, along with Jesus' disciples, they, they probably know each other. This is an embarrassing situation. And she's just simply trying to remedy it to save a bit of embarrassment. So she goes and she makes an appeal to Jesus, who is her eldest son, of course. And in this, we see that she is expressing that confidence in him that goes back all the way to the time when it was told that to her that she would have Jesus, that she would give birth to him. If you go all the way back in the accounts in Matthew and in Luke, especially where the angels come to her and tell her about the fact that Jesus is going to be unique, it's going to be special and a lot of different things in that. She was thinking about these things through the years, so she has confidence in him. And when he responds to her in verse four, woman, in our language, it seems like it's a bit terse, a bit gruff, but this is the same term that Jesus used when he was hanging on the cross and suffering, and he commended his mother to the care of John the Apostle. And so it's not a rough term. It's actually an affectionate term in the original language. And so he's just answering her and replying to her when she says, well, they have no wine. He says, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. And he's simply saying in that it's not time for me to be so open about who I am and what I can do. But we go a little bit further here and notice in verses 6 through 11 how that it talks about him turning water to wine. And there are people who have used this to try to say, well, see, it's okay to drink alcohol and to enjoy a few drinks now and again, because after all, Jesus turned water to wine. Let's understand that in the Bible, Wine could be alcoholic or non-alcoholic. The same exact word is used for either. And in this case, we submit to you, it is non-alcoholic wine. And we'll step through as to why that is. First of all, it says that there are 20 or 30 gallons apiece of these water pots. So there's six of these water pots, 30, 20 to 30 gallons apiece. So that's, you know, 120 to 180 gallons of wine, water that is made into wine. And when the master of the feast tastes it, he recognizes it as good wine. You know, if he had already been drinking the entire feast, his taste buds wouldn't be so acute, so sensitive, if you will. Because he says here, when he's talking to the bridegroom, that when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior wine set out, but you saved this new wine until now, the fresh wine, the good stuff, you saved it until now. So they had well drunk, and now Jesus makes 120 to 180 gallons more of this wine. And if it had been alcoholic, Jesus would have been guilty of getting these people hammered. So we understand that it's not alcoholic wine. If you go back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65, and notice this with me. It's just one of the places where it illustrates in the Bible that, uh, you know, wine could be either alcoholic or non-alcoholic, and the context determines which is which. In Isaiah 65 verse 8, it says, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster And one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so I will do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. The new wine found in the cluster is talking about the juice of the grape. And when they're referring to the new wine here in John chapter 2, he's saying it's fresh grape juice. It's very tasty, very fresh. The master of the feast noticed that. Again, it tells us that he hasn't been drinking alcohol throughout this entire feast to the point that they ran out of their supplies. 
No, his taste buds are intact. And it tells us that this is non-alcoholic. Jesus would not have gotten all of these people drunk. Now, something very important and what we really want to get to when he turns the water to wine, it says very plainly here that Jesus did this beginning of signs in John 2 verse 11 and manifested his glory. You see, there are some people that say that Jesus performed miracles by proxy, by solely the power of the Holy Spirit or solely the power of the Father. But Jesus, being divine, being God, had inherent power in himself to perform miracles. And this show, shows us right here in John 2.11 that he manifested his glory. It manifests his nature, that is, his divine nature. So this miracle proved that he was indeed the divine son of God performed by his power and showing his power over nature, over the elements. Now, there's one other thing we want to catch here in verse 12. It says that Jesus, his mother, his brothers and his disciples went down to Capernaum, but they didn't stay many days. The thing I want to key in on is Jesus had brothers. You know, there are people who claim that Mary gave birth to Jesus and never had any more children. And so they say that she was a perpetual virgin. Well, the Bible disputes that claim. The Bible shows that she not only had Jesus but she had other children as well. There are different accounts that talk about his brother, his sisters, his mother, and so on. So she was not a perpetual virgin. That's a false concept. Well, when we look at this, though, to see the big picture of what John is laying out for us here, Jesus began to do these signs to prove himself as the divine Savior of man. Let that sink into your heart and honor him for who he truly is. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. With this lesson, we continue in our series of studies in the book of 1 Peter. You recall that 1 Peter is written to Christians in the first century who are facing great trials. In chapter 2, he begins by reminding them who they are, how it is that God views them, of course, in the contrast with how the world views them and mistreats them. But he reminds them that God views them as living stones, as a chosen generation, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation. And so he calls on them to conduct themselves in a godly and upright way in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, as he tells them as strangers and pilgrims in this world to abstain from fleshly lust and that they are to live in a way that helps to bring others to God, that others observe their good works, their faithfulness to God, their uh, behavior that benefits the world around them. And in this study, we're going to look at verses 13 down through 25 as he begins to make specific application to that general principle of living in a righteous and godly way in this ungodly world, even when they face circumstances that are difficult and challenging and unfair at times. So let's begin by reading 1 Peter 2, verses 13 down through 17. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, 
love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So we can see how that this relates to the charge that they are to live before the world in an upright way. And the question comes up as he discusses this submission to government, how far does that submission go? Just how far are we supposed to do what the government tells us to do? Well, in Acts chapter 5, we have a principle that's laid down here. If you recall in Acts chapter 5 that the apostles, Peter, John, the others, have been arrested for preaching in the name of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 5, 29, Peter responds when the Jewish leaders, the governing authorities there, tell them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And he says this in Acts 5, verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. And here's the principle, to put it another way, that God's law is superior to man's law. And any time those two are in conflict, God's law is the law that we are to follow, regardless of consequences. So one of the applications we make of this is that man cannot outlaw what God authorizes. Remember in John chapter 4, John chapter 4, where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he states this to help clarify in her mind about the nature of, uh, serving God, and if it's tied to a specific location in the context they're discussing, is it at Mount Gerizim or is it in Jerusalem? But here's what the Lord said. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. Then those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And so God is seeking for men to worship him. And man cannot outlaw the worship of God. Man cannot say, no, you cannot worship God. Let's notice one of the things involved in worshiping God in particular. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25, the Hebrew writer gives this admonition. Let us consider one another to stir up good love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So part of worshiping God is assembling together to worship God. And you see that play out through the book of Acts, and you see this reflected in the letters that Paul wrote to the various churches in many different locations, how that in these locations, congregations were formed, local churches were established, and those local churches gathered together on a regular basis to worship God. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the Apostle Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. And he says here, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So these churches we're gathering on the first day of the week, that is on Sunday. And he says that the churches in Galatia were doing this. The church at Corinth was doing this. Other churches in other places were doing this. As we read in Acts chapter 20, where Paul waited in his travels so that he could meet with the church at Troas on the first day of the week. So they're assembling regularly every Sunday. And here he's just saying that when you do that, you need to lay something aside. So we talk about this as the contribution or the giving that the members of that local church were to do. Now, here's the point we're striving to get at is when the Word of God tells us that we are to worship God and we are to come together and assemble and not forsake that assembling, the government has no right to come and to tell us you can't do that. It's up to the local congregations 
to make determinations maybe on inclement weather or safety conditions or some other extraordinary circumstances, whether it is safe for them to assemble. But the Lord says you need to assemble with the saints. And when he gives us that authority, that means the government can't come along and forbid us to do that, forbid us to assemble to sing and pray and to observe the Lord's Supper, to study the Word of God, and as we already noted, to give of the blessings that God has provided us to help to support the work of the church. On the flip side of that, not only can the government not forbid what God has authorized, but the government cannot authorize what God has forbidden. So, Think about the issue of marriage. The Bible teaches us that marriage is between a man and a woman. And it's between one man and one woman, to be specific. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when the apostle addresses the issues that they had asked him about, he says in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So the Bible presents to us that marriage is between one man and one woman. Now, the government will try to pass in laws. Well, it can be between a man and a man, a woman and a woman. There's some places where people marry their animals and all kinds of odd things where men may marry many different women at the same time, but that's not what the Bible presents to us. And so even though the government has authorized it in the laws of the state or the laws of the land, it's still forbidden by God. And so when they do that, they're in rebellion toward God. They're in violation of God's will. And we are under no obligation to accept that to condone that, to promote that, to support that. We are under no obligation whatsoever. In fact, we need to point out how that that is a violation of the will of God. So God's law is superior to man's law. And what God has authorized, man cannot forbid. And what God has forbidden, man cannot authorize. It's unlawful. So, Let's notice this back again in 1 Peter chapter 2 and how that he's encouraging Christians essentially to be good citizens where they live. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, notice again in verse 13, he says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Now I'm reading from the New King James Version. King James is similar to that. But the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Bible says institution. So it would read like this. Therefore, submit yourselves to every institution of man for the Lord's sake. And so that gives a little bit different understanding of it. And here's the point that when he says to obey or submit yourselves to every ordinance or every institution of man, he's not saying that we have to absolutely strictly adhere to every law that man passes, um, every rule, every regulation, every statute. And if you don't, then you're in sin. Because here's one of the things that as you look at this from the practical side, that there's an issue, there's a problem. Uh, there's a book out by the name of Harvey Silvergate. It's Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent. Now, in this book, what he says is that it's estimated that every citizen of the United States commits three felonies per day without knowing it because there's so many books on the law. It's so vast of a body of law, of rules, of regulations, and things like that, that we violate it all the time without even realizing that. And that's not a rebellion. That is simply just not knowing what all is on the books. And think about this. Uh, one report says that it's estimated if you read 700 pages of the U.S. code per week, it would take you 25,000 years to finish it. That's how many rules and regulations 
are in the U.S. code or the U.S. law books, if you will. You know, many laws that we have, so to speak, don't go through Congress, but are regulations enacted by federal agencies. And did you know that it's a federal crime to have a lobster under a certain size, regardless of how you came into possession of it, that you could go to jail? Uh, if somebody gave it to you, if you happen to, to trap that lobster and catch it and it's in your possession, you just didn't realize it didn't meet that size or uh, somehow you came into possession of it, it's a violation of federal law. Uh, here's another one. You're really going to like this. In Wyoming, it's illegal to take a picture of a rabbit from January through April without a special permit. And that comes from lawyers.com. So it's... It's against the law to take a picture of a rabbit from January to April. Now, let me ask you something. Is God really concerned about you taking a picture of a rabbit during certain months of the year in the state of Wyoming? And if you take the picture in Wyoming and then you take another picture, let's say, across the border in Nebraska or to the south in Colorado, uh, you're not committing a crime. So... There, there's some arbitrary things, you know. Uh, Lawyers.com also says that in California, you cannot eat an orange in a bathtub. You'd be violating the law. Here's a pretty good one. Again, Lawyers.com. In Kentucky, every citizen is required to take a shower once a year. Now, we like that law. And that probably should be a law everywhere. But we can see how it's silly. You know, these laws that have been on the books maybe for many years. You can see how some of them, maybe in times past, like taking a shower, you know, maybe there was a, a governor or a judge at some time in Kentucky that somebody came in their presence and they stunk pretty bad and they're like, look, everybody's got to clean up at least once a year. But be that as it may, the point is there are so many laws and so many archaic laws, out-of-date laws that just don't fit our time or arbitrary that somebody has just issued a decree and it makes no sense at all. There's no logic, no reason. Uh, it's just somebody who, who's making a decree maybe just to exercise their authority and their power. The founding father sometimes comes up in this discussion, you know, submission to government. Well, the founding fathers rebelled against the British crown, you know, back in the late 1700s. And there's a website called wallbuilders.com that has a discussion on there about the founding father's position on government. The American Revolution was it an act of biblical rebellion. And here's some of the things that are discussed in it. The founding fathers looked at it as we are forbidden in the word of God to overthrow the institution of government and to live in anarchy. That is to live without government. Like we see some people in our society today, their goal is to overthrow government, any form of government. And to live in anarchy, that's part of what we see with all the riots that have taken place in our society. And the founding fathers looked at the word of God because they were men who believed in the word. They believed at least in the principles of the word. And they were careful when they weighed out what the Bible said with the reality of their situation and what they were facing. And they came to the conclusion it was wrong to dispel government or dispose of government to get rid of it altogether. So they weren't looking to get rid of government and governing authorities in society. And one of the things they looked at was examples of Gideon or Ehud, so some of the judges, Jephthah, Deborah, and how that there were those who were ruling over them and abusing them, and they overthrew that tyrannical yoke. And so the founders view that they resisted tyranny, not government. And one of the other things they looked at is that God allows for a defensive war. 
And their position was that Great Britain is the one who was the aggressor. And so they acted in the colonies to defend themselves against that aggression because Great Britain had sent 25,000 troops that invaded people's homes. They took private property, private possessions. They imprisoned citizens without trial. And they did all of this in violation of British common law, of the English Bill of Rights, and of the Magna Carta. So there was a governing law for British citizens that the government itself was not respecting. And when the colonies resisted that, it was not them resisting law or government in and of itself. It was resisting the abuse of the law and an abuse of the governing authorities. Now, something else we might want to note, just turn to the Bible. Remember in Acts chapter 5, which we referenced earlier, Peter, John, the other apostles had been arrested. And if you recall that an angel came and helped them to escape jail. So God was involved directly with the apostles resisting the authorities on that occasion. In Acts chapter 12, after James was beheaded, Peter was arrested. And again, God sent an angel to help him escape prison. So that was a form of non-submission or resistance to the governing authorities in that case. Because in that case, in Acts chapter 12, that was Herod, King Herod, who had arrested Peter and intended to execute him. But God sent an angel to lead him out. And if you go back to the Old Testament, the case of David and Saul, Saul being the king and uh, David being pursued by him. And the king's order was that David was to be apprehended and he intended to kill David. But David didn't just roll over and let that happen. But he escaped Saul's um, pursuit. He ran away from him. He didn't just allow Saul to do whatever Saul wanted to do to capture and to kill him. And so we see that when you read in 1 Peter chapter 2 about submitting to every ordinance or as other translations have, and this really is the meaning of it, to submit to every institution of man, it's not simply saying, well, do whatever the current governing authorities are telling you to do. And if you don't do every little thing and dot every I and cross every T and submit to every decree or edict that goes out, that you are in rebellion toward God. But we are to respect the fact that God has put governments in place to do good. In fact, back in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 14, he says, those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So God established government for a purpose, and its purpose is to suppress evil and uphold what is good. And there are times when governments abuse the very reason and purpose for their existence. And instead of punishing evil, they support, they condone, they overlook, they encourage evil. And in support, instead of supporting good, they suppress that good. They punish the good. And so when government violates these principles, the government itself or the governing authorities are in rebellion toward God. Now, verses 15 and 16 in 1 Peter chapter 2 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. In other words, be a good citizen. Do what you can to comply with the governing authorities. We have in our nation, at least, a constitution. We have state constitutions that are to be the supreme laws of the land. Now, again, God's word is above both of those. No matter what they say, God's word is superior to those. And if we respect God, we love God, we're going to follow his word first and foremost. But we still have an obligation to strive to be good citizens, that Christianity and civil obedience to a government is the right thing to do to be a good example 
to the world around us that Christianity is not a religion that seeks to overthrow governments, that seeks to break the yoke of the governing authorities, the kings, the governors, as he lists them out here. It, it's not a religion of rebellion. It's a religion that individuals submit to Christ and they respect the governments that have been put in place. And they are model citizens because they do follow God's will, first of all, which makes them good, moral, decent, honest, kind people who also are a benefit and a blessing to the society around them. He says we're not to use freedom in Christ as an excuse to rebel against government. In other words, we can't say, well, Christ is my king, and I don't have to listen to you. You know, Jesus very specifically said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God, in reference to paying taxes. Romans 13 says that we are to pay our taxes. We're not to rebel against that. That is a legitimate, God-ordained thing that governments have the right to do, to raise taxes. Now, I don't like paying excessive taxes. I'm sure you don't like paying excessive taxes. Maybe we don't like paying taxes at all because it's taking out of our pocket. We see sometimes how it's wasted, how it's abused, but we still have a duty and obligation to pay taxes, to pay what we are supposed to under the laws under which we live or by the laws under which we live. And so our freedom in Christ doesn't mean we can do whatever we want to and ignore the governing authorities and the legitimate laws that are there. But freedom in Christ is for the purpose of being set free from sin. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know, our righteous behavior, as he's talking about here, can silence our enemies. It demonstrates to others our goodness in contrast to the unjust and biased claims of our enemies. As we show consistent respect and genuine desire to live peaceably with others, it's going to be a blessing and a benefit to help to draw people to God and to do His will. We're not looking for a fight. We're just simply striving to live a peaceable and quiet and godly life, as Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So he ends up this section in verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So we honor all people. We even love our enemies, as Jesus said. We love the brotherhood. There are others who serve God. We need to love them and look out for them. We are to fear God. And the Bible is consistent about fearing God and not fearing man. We are never commanded to fear men. We are commanded to fear God, have a reverence for Him, and fear what rebellion toward Him means and the consequences of that. But we love Him. And we serve him with that reverential fear. And he says here again at the end, honor the king. So we behave as good citizens to bring glory to God that we may help to bring others to him. Now, in a moment, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the rest of 1 Peter chapter 2 as he talks about the relationships between servants and masters. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search Word and Sword TV program. Let's now look at the rest of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, as Peter talks about servants and masters and their relationship to one another and gives Christ as the ultimate example. In 1 Peter 2, verse 18, beginning, Be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, 
When you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So first of all, he says that we are to submit to our masters. Now, he says with all fear, and just in the last segment, we looked at this idea that the Bible tells us to fear God and not man. So let's understand right here when he says submit to your masters with all fear, he's not saying all fear toward the masters, but all fear toward God, because you you may have a master here on earth, but you have one who is above that even. You have God who is supreme over all. That's who you need to be thinking about in this relationship between you and your master. Or in modern terms, we might say between an employee and an employer. So that's the idea that he's putting before us here. He says, you submit not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh, because we've all probably had people who are over us in the work that we're doing. Maybe some who are younger in school, you've had a teacher or someone in authority who's been over you that's been a harsh individual. They're just not kind. They're not nice people. And they give you uh, a hard time. They make life difficult on you. And he's saying here that we are to submit not only to those good and gentle ones that it's easy to submit to, but to submit to those who are even harsh, who are difficult. Um, He goes on to say that there's really no virtue in patiently suffering for your wrong. So if you've done something wrong and you're punished for it, it's not anything special that you accept that punishment and move on with your life. But what is virtuous and what God takes note of is when you are mistreated, even though you've done everything right. When you take that punishment patiently, when you're innocent, you take that patiently, then God takes note of that. He sees that, and that's commendable before Him. And He then goes on to give Christ as our ultimate example in this situation. He says in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us. Now, let's understand, in this context here, what he's really looking at is the idea of not just your day-to-day things that you do in the work and those who are over you in the work that you do, but really your faith and how that some people may mistreat you because of your belief in God, your belief in his word. And so just as Christ believed in the Father and the Father's will, he went forward in doing the Father's will regardless of how much suffering he had to go through for that. And so we need to have that same type of attitude that we are called to suffer for the faith Because as we strive to live for God, we are going to encounter conflict in this world because the world hates the light. Darkness does not accept the light. As 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So when we draw closer to God, We are further separated from the world, and the world gets angry about that, and the world will attack us for it. And we need to live in a way, just as Christ did, that we have no sin, we have no deceit. I'm not saying that we live sinless, but when it comes to this conflict, that we 
maintain self-discipline and we don't do as they do. When they revile us, we don't revile in return. When they have treated us spitefully or vengefully, we don't reply in that same spirit with that same attitude, but that we conduct ourselves in a kind and generous and patient in a forbearing way, remaining faithful to the Lord that we may have an impact and an influence on the people who are around us. Now, again, backing up just a little bit, you know, Peter is writing this to people in the first century who were literally slaves of others. There would be servants who would receive this. There would be those who work for other people. Um, so not quite the employment atmosphere that we see in our society today, but those who were under the yoke of a master, whether servant or slave or however that relationship may be. And he's telling them, you need to endure this. You need to uh, conduct yourselves uprightly. And so if they can, then we can today because we even have more choices. You know, they didn't have a choice to say, well, I don't want to be your slave anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else. What they had to do is just submit. Now, in our society, in modern times, there's a lot of freedom. Now, it may be difficult to make some choices because of obligations that we have and concerns about getting employment somewhere else. But we do have choices. We have recourse. We have recourse to the courts uh, that we can appeal to the law of the land to protect us in certain situations. If it's dangerous, if we've been mistreated, if we've been abused in some way, uh, we have the ability to go and find work elsewhere, to be in a different environment, uh, all kinds of different things that we're so blessed with. But while we are working for those who may be harsh, we need to maintain that right and godly attitude to be a good influence and set an example for those who don't have it or those who are observing us, you know, how will he act? How will she act in this situation? But be that as it may, we understand that Peter is urging us and telling us, here's how you live as a Christian in the world where you're going to face mistreatment, great trials, you're going to be persecuted for your faith. You make sure that you remain committed to God because that is exactly what Jesus did. He didn't lose self-control, self-discipline. He rather committed his soul, as it says here, to him who judges righteously. And we need to do that. Trust in God. Trust that God is working in these events in our life working in the lives of other people. And it may be simply that our example is working in the life of a co-worker or even in someone who's over us and is harsh toward us, and that our example ends up softening their heart, ends up leading someone to know and to serve God themselves. So we have to trust in Him and that He will settle all accounts in the end. We are not the ones to do that, to exact the vengeance. Vengeance is the Lord's and not ours. And our suffering very well may serve a higher purpose. As Christ's suffering served a higher purpose, the suffering we face, the mistreatment we face, may very well be serving a higher purpose. And so at the very end there, he says in verse 25, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." couple of points we want to make out of that. First of all, how did Jesus become the shepherd and overseer? He did it through sacrifice, through giving himself for us. And everyone who is a leader must sacrifice for those that they intend to lead. They must act in their best interest, not in their personal best interest, in the best interest of those they're seeking to lead, they're seeking to help. So that's how Jesus was brought into that position of the shepherd and overseer of our souls. 
But then the other thing is he is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And we need to comply with that. We need to accept the gift that he has given in sacrificing his life for us. We need to turn to him and obey him in all things, trusting in him as our Lord and Savior. And so if we can help you to do that, as you strive to live righteously in this world, to be a light in this world of darkness, then we would love to be able to do that. Please reach out and let us know. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail or to be added to the church's quarterly mail out of the bulletin or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this TV program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. That's again, wordandsword.com. Visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. Again, that's facebook.com slash word and sword. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. Our classes are for those of all ages. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information once more. The phone, 828-465-3009. Email, contact at wordandsword.com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. Our website is wordandsword.com. And our address is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I Thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Be Thou my buckler, sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, and thou my high tower. Come raise me Nor man's empty praise 